and we are live. Hey, welcome everybody to this historic night. We we are here. Me, Jason Matthews, uh, the financial guru. We have Tandaway Cato, uh, aka T with Cato, and tonight we have uh, Theo's Watson, the community banker. Tonight, uh, talking about the PPP loan as well. Uh, we're really excited about it. Just route three of the PPP loan. There's a loan forgiveness out there. I know a lot of people have questions. So what we really want to do is just educate the American people and our Facebook friends and everybody else in the world as this will eventually be on uh, YouTube as well. If you have not subscribed, subscribe to Jason Matthews on YouTube to watch a recording of this because Theodore's Watch is about to get some great gems tonight uh, regarding, uh, regarding the whole PPP loan program, what's happening and everything else. Uh, Tanda, would you like to say any comments before we get the theaters going? Sure. I just want to say this is really important topic. So I'm glad we're here with Theotis Watson, who's going to give us some special tips on the next round of the PPP loans program. Definitely. And here we go. Theodos, tell us about what's going on with the PPP loan. Give us, give us what's happening new. I know there's a lot of revelations uh, coming out with it. So go ahead and, and tell us about the new PPP loans and all this program. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, T, for allowing me to be here. As Jason mentioned, I'm Theodos Watson, uh, Western, Vice Pre Western Region Vice President of Vermont Financial Services Coalition, uh, a, the community's banker. And uh, before we dive in, just wanted to give you a little bit about myself and why I named myself that. Um, as you see these photos here, um, I, I've just been blessed uh, with being supportive of, 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 of community, uh, with bankers, uh, doctors, family, friends. And so I thought it was equally important uh, for me to be able to, do, now that I'm in a position to serve, uh, to be able to do this for my community. Um, and then this photo here on the right side, um, you can look at this a number of ways. One, you can look at it as a big bank coming in, about to smash the local community, smash a local bank. Uh, but what I see here is a local bank kicking out the larger institutions uh, because this is what reminds me of PPP. Uh, PPP, uh, small community banks have done a lot and served a lot of small businesses within our community. Uh, we're very excited about what we're able to do. I work for a local institution, a regional bank. Um, and we've been able to serve a lot of communities, uh, a lot of businesses, and, and we're very excited about that. So uh, my role as a community banker is just really continue to, to educate. I've been able to, to be able to work at and manage branches and institutions and, and low to moderate income institutions, but also I have the ability to manage high net worth uh, institutions as well. So I'm here for everybody. It's not just one community, uh, but I am here for the community in, at large. But let's talk PPP, right? Um, everyone has been hearing about it. Everyone knows about it. It's been on your news feed. It's on Facebook Live right now, right? So um, Paycheck Protection Program is, is a loan program that originated through uh, the corona, Coronavirus Aid uh, Relief and Economic Security Cares Act is what it's known as, a $350 billion program intended to serve American small businesses. Uh, the program has expanded uh, to by the Paycheck Protection Program and Health um, Enhancement Act in late April adding an additional $310 billion in funding. And yes, I said billion dollars in funding. And so now we're on round three of this. And on December 27th, uh, 2020, a second stimulus package was signed into law and topping up the program with an additional 285 billion, there's a billion word again, in funding and updating the eligible expenses. Um, it is open up for a second PPP loan for those businesses who took advantage of the first draw, and then for those individuals who were not um, uh, unable to take advantage of the first draw, you can now apply for your first draw. But uh, for those individuals and those businesses who were able to take advantage of the of the first draw before, uh, there's a caveat in this in this next phase uh, where you must show 
a 25% or greater decrease in gross revenues. And so we'll talk a little bit about that um, in order to qualify. So first draw PPP loan forgiveness terms. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. And Jason and Ms. T, if you have any questions about anything, please chime in. Uh, but the first draw of the PPP loan uh, is, are made to eligible borrowers who qualify for loan forgiveness. Um, if during eight to 24 week covered period following the loan disbursement. And what that means is a, hey, you get a, a, your loan on uh, August 15th of the first draw, you have eight weeks or 24 weeks, depending on how fast you spend that money to spend that money. You have to spend it within at least that 24 week covered period. Um, what qualifies you um, and, and what allows this option to be forgiven is employee and payroll levels must be maintained. And the number for uh, that is normally around 25%. If you, long as you kept your payroll maintained for at least uh, the 25% uh, or, or more, you're pretty good. Your forgiveness process is a little bit easier. Now, unfortunately, if your business had some challenges, you had to let go of some people within that time frame, uh, you could still possibly get it forgiven. But there are there are some additional there's some additional documents you have to provide, um, in which I'll talk a little bit about that here. Um, the 60/40 rules are met, and what I mean by that is 60% of your your uh, loan had to be or more had to be spent on payroll, um, health health benefits for your employees, all of that, and then 40% could be. Uh, met on, uh, could be spent on eligible expenses. So it could be, you know, utilities and mortgage, you know, you, the interest on your mortgage or uh, your rent and lease payments to uh, your landlord. So those 40% uh, of, the, of the funding can be spent on those, but a lot of my clients, 100% of it was going on payroll and that's fine. Um, and, and, and that's pretty much what this program is for. And of course, as I meant, the, the PPP funds are spent on eligible expenses. As I mentioned before, you got to spend it on those things. So if they are outside that window of utilities and lease and mortgage and rent, um, you know, it should still be forgiven, but you don't want to play with the SBA. You don't want to play with the government. You want to play within those guidelines and, and, and try, to, try to meet that. If you have questions, if it's if you have some speculative uh, expenses, you want to make sure you check with your bank. Yes, sir. Uh, how long until you have to apply for the forgiveness program? Um, good question. So it is 10 months from the end of your forgiveness period. So let's say, you know, August 1st, you received it. Uh, six months from, uh, uh, six weeks from that, you spent the money. Um, and then at the end of your 24-week period, you have, you have 10 months from the time of your end of your cover period, which would be that 24 weeks, until uh, that 10 months ends is to apply for forgiveness. So you don't have to run out and do it, but I do encourage borrowers for the first draw, once you spent that money, get your application in and uh, you know get that off your books if you can. Good question. Uh, loan forgiveness continued. So to apply for loan forgiveness, uh, your lender will provide a you know SBA form. All of these documents are either found on the SBA website, sba.gov, or you can find more information at the U.S. Treasury website. But your lender can provide you with their form. Um, it's the SBA 3508. Uh, there's a 3508EZ, and then there's a 3508S. And sometimes lenders, depending on the institution, uh, they have their own lender equivalent applications. And so uh, the 3508 is more of an extended version of the application, mainly for those businesses who may experience 25% or greater in employee turnover, uh, who may have to complete that form. The 3508EZ are mainly for uh, those businesses who, um, who had, you know, obviously maintained that you know, 25% or less reduction in employee. Um, and if you if you have loans above 150,000 or less or 150,000 or more, uh, you may have to apply for that EZ. Now the SBA form at 3508 is a recent form that came out, I believe January 19th. 
uh, which is a revised version of that form. If you have a loan that is less than 150,000 or less, you can complete the revised 3508S form. And that's the only thing you need to send in uh, to your bank. It is an easy, straightforward form. It's just a one page application. Um, and I encourage if your loan is under 150,000 and less, seek out that 3508S revised form. It's a very straightforward form, two certifications of, of signatures that you have to sign. Um, obviously sign the application and you're done. Um, very easy, very likable uh, forms. Uh, and, I, and But the other forms, 3508 in, a, in the easy, you do have to submit some documentation, which we'll talk about in order for you to qualify for forgiveness. Um, as I mentioned here, in order to, to receive forgiveness, uh, you must provide payroll information. So this could be bank statements for, so let's say, Schedule C borrowers who, you know, don't do payroll. Um, if you can show proof of bank statements, you know, highlights, circle, whatever you need to do to show where you may have cut those checks to, your, to you or, let's say, an employee, uh, you got to show proof of that. Tax forms. Uh, so if you have 941s, 940s, uh, those are valid resources to show proof. Um, Schedule C borrowers, if you have your Schedule C uh, form, that gives you, uh, that, that tells the lender that you spent this money on, on your uh, payroll. Uh, payment of receipts and canceled checks. As I mentioned, you may not have all the fancy payroll services or may not need that, uh, but payment receipts and canceled checks are valid sources of payroll information uh, to be able to apply for forgiveness. And we talked about the non-payroll business mortgage interest payments, business rent and lease payments, business utility payments are typically the non-payroll expenses that 40% we talked about uh, that you can spend on uh, your PPP funding. Quick question, Theodos, with that. I was, yes, talking sir. To, I was talking to some guys who was working out the other day and some of them haven't even spent all their money yet. They've been really just stacking that money, which is kind of crazy. Um, but they've been stacking that money. Can they apply for the forgiveness? Why that might be just say why they may just lay that money just sit and stack? Or can they apply for the forgiveness if it's below that 150 mark threshold? Or what would you recommend? I do not want to tell an individual what they can or cannot do. I would just encourage them if it doesn't have to be that money, right? So obviously they may be paying for some expenses if they're so if they're a Schedule C, you know, they don't have payroll, but they might be paying for again living expenses, writing themselves a check out to pay for rent or whatever the case may be. We want them to use that money. That's what that money is designed for, to use it, to stay employed, you know, to, to, to feed your, your, pay your employees, feed your family. So I can't say stack the money and then apply for forgiveness if you never spent the money. You do have to show proof that you spent that money in some capacity, because that was the idea of that, of that program is to get the money out to those borrowers so they can, uh, you know, pay their employees and, and, and pay, take care of themselves. Good. That's really good information. But I, I have borrowers who did put this money in their checking or savings account, but they still had operating expenses and they, you know, had obviously income coming in from the business because some people were really skeptical of the program in the beginning. So they just wanted to have that money in case the government does not pay them off. Uh, but they still were paying employees. They still were, you know, paying for whatever expenses, their interest or their rent and lease out of their operating expenses. They just didn't use the money that the bank gave them. You know, they put it in a savings account. That's okay. As long as you can show proof that you spit that money or a percentage of that money of that loan um, on your expenses, you should be fine. You should be good to go. Good question. So the eligibility requirements uh, for the first time draw. So first time PPP loans, um, again, these are for those individuals who did not take advantage of the first and second round of the PPP program. Uh, up to 10 million borrowers are, who are in operation as of February 15th, 2020. 
Um, and so you have to be in operation by February 15th. I'm sorry, businesses, if you opened your business February 16th or March 1st, you do not qualify for this PPP loan program. Uh, for the first draw, you still have to, you still qualify for the first uh, requirements, which were businesses with 500 or fewer employees. Uh, for those sole proprietors, independent contractors are also eligible um, as self-employed individuals. Uh, the not-for-profits, including churches, operations, uh, and individuals, uh, NAICS codes, uh, businesses have NAICS codes starting at 72 and have fewer than 500 employees per physical location. Um, they now can apply for chambers of commerce, visitors bureaus, uh, destination marketing organizations that have 300 or fewer employees. This was a big thing last time because a lot of the chamber of commerce is, um, and those other entities like that were unable to apply for uh, the forgiveness loan forgiveness program. And so we felt, I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad that they are able to get that funding because they do are there are major purpose in our small business community. Um, and so now they can get access to this to kind of serve uh, their organization as well. So, so they now can are eligible to do that. Okay. Uh, one question I wanted to ask is, did you see a lot of like sole props or independent contractors applying to the other rounds? Um, I did actually, and it goes to my point that first time around, when they did uh, the first and second round, that first round, sole proprietors and independent contractors could not apply until I, I think a week after everyone else was. Um, and so that was a little discouraging for some individuals because again, they're a business and they deserve you know, the same, same uh, opportunities that everyone else. Uh, but I think it is a little difficult to understand and under to estimate what their payroll records would be, you know, what they qualify for. So I think the SBA needed to have uh, some time to kind of figure that piece out. And, and, and I think they did, obviously they did. And so they did a really good job of that. So yes, I did see a lot of sole proprietors go after that. They are often the, the businesses that um, are left out. And so I make it a purpose to make sure I reach out to those businesses to make sure they get access to that funding because it is very important that they, that they get access to that. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, good, good question. Um, eligibility requirements for a second draw. So now, you know, Jason Matthews, he got his, you know, 10 million the first time. And now he's looking at getting, uh, you know, the next amount. Unfortunately, you can't get 10 million this time, Jason. I'm sorry, you can't. Oh, man. Um, I, do too, though. I, I know, I know. I was, you know, I don't think you're one of those guys who were getting the Bentleys buying the Bentley trucks. I don't think you were that. Oh, I was never supposed to all that, man. I ain't, trying to get <laughs> I ain't one of these rappers trying to go to jail, man. That's what I'm saying. That was jail for no. me. No, no, no. You're much more responsible than that. But no, the second draw this time is up to 2 million. So those are for those individuals who were able to qualify uh, for the first round. They now can get up to $2 million for this next round. Um, and as long as you show proof uh, that you spent the money uh, and or uh, you applied for forgiveness and got it forgiven. So we're running into situations where you know, I have clients who maybe went to a different institution the first time that they're coming to us to do their second draw. Uh, you make it easier on the banks. If you got it forgiven, provide your forgiveness document. The SBA provides a forgiveness document that shows that your loan was paid off. Um, or if it's still in limbo with the other institution in regards to forgiveness, you have to show proof that you spent that money. So uh, what, that, what I mean by that is provide a profit and loss statement for the year to show your employee expenses. If you have your 940 and 941 um, quarterly statements, uh, provide that to the bank and let them know, hey, I'm, I am you know, still waiting for forgiveness from my other institution. Obviously, if you bank with me, did it on the first time, and now you're going about the second time, you know, most banks are going to, you know, we're going to require or at least, you know, strongly suggest that you apply for your forgiveness on the first draw so we can go ahead and get that off the books and we can take care of you on that second one. 
All institutions are different. Everybody does it a little different, uh, but most banks want to see, and the SBA does require that the business shows proof that they spent that money, all the money, um, before they apply for the next round. Okay, so they do, what happened to, I see that simple form you were talking about. What happened if someone has applied for forgiveness, they can still apply though, am I correct? Yes, absolutely. So your loan doesn't have to be forgiven. Um, it can be pending um, and you can still apply for the second round. And then why, tell me some reason why somebody would move from one institution to another for applying for this PPP program. What, what reasons are you seeing out there in the marketplace? In the community. My, my, my picture of the of the big bank is is, is a prime example, right? So I got uh, I have actually I'm, I'm I have worked on three today where client A went to a large institution, one of the big ones. I won't throw anybody out there, but one of the large institutions, and everything was automated, right? Everything was through the online portal, automated, which is great because sometimes it does streamline the process. But if a borrower A has a question, you know, or want to just speak to somebody. Um, they don't even have a, this bank don't even have a contact number. Um, you know, you, don't, you, you know, they, they don't even know, you know, they may have questions about the second draw or their second option. Um, and so what I'm finding out is, you know, just again, the service, just having someone talk to someone, being able to educate them on the new expectations or what their options are. I'm seeing what now, hey, I'd rather go to my bank who I deal with first. Yeah, bank one was this bank over here was faster and quicker and online or whatever the case may be. But now I have questions. I need to talk to somebody, I need to develop a relationship with somebody. And also now they are seeing, you know, they help them or they're responsive. Let me go ahead and bring all my business to this bank because now I have some other needs that I can, that I can help with. So, or that I need help with. So that's one of the reasons why I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of businesses going from, let's say, a larger bank or another institution, it's just really the responsiveness, the complexity of this program, and they need to talk to somebody about what's going on. You, you said something, a great point. You're talking about relationships. How can, uh, how can a small business owner develop a relationship with the bank? What things, what steps should a small business owner do to develop that relationship? So I know a lot of people during this period, they have a relationship in the bank during the first PPP program. What, how do you develop that relationship with your, with your bank or banker, especially when you see bankers leaving every three or, three or four years and going to other institutions? So what are some key things you could do to make a good tight relationship? That's, that's, that's a great, that's a, a great question. And, um, and I'm sure I won't have the answer, but one of the things I truly believe is simply just ask questions. You know, when you, when you are as a small business, if you, and I know, and that's one thing I try, and that's why I do this, and I call myself the community's banker, because I know it's intimidating walking into a bank, asking them for money, or just asking them questions about basic banking questions, you know, and, and some people do see a guy sitting back in the back with a tie, thinking they looking important, you know, and thinking, hey, that's kind of intimidating me going in and asking this person a question. Ask questions as a small business. If you don't know who your banker is, you need to go talk to your bank and develop a relationship with your banker. The first thing is just go in and just talk to them. A lot of times, banks bankers want to talk to our customers. We do. We we the more relations we build, the more opportunities you know may come down the pipeline. We should be here. So I would say ask questions. Um, if you don't know who your banker is, find the name. And if you don't have a banker, you need to contact, uh, you know, either a small business development center um, or any other small business resource uh, organization in your community, uh, because I'm sure they have some good bankers that they partner with that can help you through this transition. And I'm going to give you one example real quick. Um, through this process here in Kansas City, if you can't know, you see me, you see the big ring in the back. Um, don't do it to us, man. We're here in San Francisco Bay Area. We don't want to hear a ring right now. We don't want to hear nothing. I don't want to say, Tom, I, 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 oh, man. Mary, I said, I got him fired up, Bay 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 I am sorry. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Tom, okay. bring revenge back for the Niners, man. <laughs> we didn't talk about 2019. We talked about 20, 2021, 2022. But um, no. I, one thing we did here is really we partner with other uh, 
local organizations to assist small businesses like um, the Small Business Development Centers, you know, the uh, Kansas City Chamber, you know, one example is a Prospect Business Association which serves businesses on the Kansas City on the east side in our urban core. So we'd be able to create kind of an ecosystem for them. So when those businesses, as you mentioned, need a relationship, don't have someone to go contact about this stuff, this program, um, they go to them and they will ship them around and talk and, 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 and connect them with banks who can help them. They already have the checklist, they have the expectations, you know, those things, that's where it starts. And then now once you have a relationship, you cultivate that. Hey, follow up with your banker, you know, see what's going on. You can call them anytime or she anytime when you don't have a problem and just say, you know, what's going on? You know, I'm running into this challenge. You know, that's how you develop that relationship. Um, and, and a lot of times we're open to have conversations because we want to make sure the more successful you are, the better we this relationship can be. So I think to that piece, really ask questions connect with local small business institutions, and then simply walk into your bank. And if your bank does not have the time or resources to help you, you need to find another bank. And I mean that. Hey, you know, one good thing to start helping me really build up my relationship with my bank, just for a token, is I know everyone's, we're always quick to go to the ATM machine nowadays. Mm -hmm. But that ATM machine, just, just sometimes you just got to walk in. You know, I don't get checks every day. None of us get paper checks every day, right? Right. You just walk in. Or if you need cash, just walk in and just introduce yourself. I think it might be just a key thing. And pretty soon you start doing it, and they won't even ask you for an ID at your bank. And I think that might be a good step as well. You you more in the banking world compared yeah. to where me and T we're financial advisors, but I think that might be huge. Just to that is huge. That, that that's a great point because the branch manager, the people, and Brent and banks is. There, we are much more than just banking. You know, we have resources. So we have clients who are contractors. We have clients who are CPAs. We have clients who are accountants. We got clients who are attorneys. We got clients who are insurance. You know, we got clients with Jason Matthews. So we have people who can help you in different areas. We don't have all the answers, but we touch so many people that it's great to have a relationship. We should be on your team. And, and, and I know this is not a business development. Could, well, I guess it is, but we should be a part of that team to kind of help you build your team as you're growing as a small business, because it's very important to have those resources around you that can help you uh, navigate some waters and some challenges, even the, in, 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 in even the positives to help your business get to that next level. So, so that's a great point of going in and just having a conversation with them, let them know who you are. Because we don't, as you know, banks are not seeing the foot traffic as they used to because of the ATMs and the mobile bankings and all of that. So people will be glad to have a conversation uh, with, with, with a small business or any individual for that fact, um, because, uh, you know, we, we know there's some opportunity out there. So going back to the second draw, um, the only difference from the first draw to this one is the key piece to to applying is you must demonstrate at least 25% reduction in gross receipts uh, between comparable quarters. And what we mean by that is it's not any three quarters, uh, it's, you know, January, February, March, you know, um, and that's the first quarter. So it has to be a comparable quarter, let's say in this case, first uh, quarter of 2019 compared to 2020 you got to show a 25% reduction in gross receipts. Other than that, I've had clients, unfortunately, are like at 22 and 19. You know, unfortunately, you don't qualify if you don't have that 25% reduction and more. And the document that you provide doesn't have to be hot and heavy. Like T, when you mentioned about small businesses or the Schedule C borrowers, you know, I've had clients bring in bank statements to show the deposits that they made, you know, in January, February, March in 2019 compared to January, February, March in 2020. Do a quick calculation. Hey, this is what I made. Oh yeah, you qualify, keep it moving. Uh, some businesses obviously have QuickBooks and other uh, financial documents. They have accountants that provide something for them. But as long as you can show proof that you have that 25% reduction, you pretty much qualify. And one little piece to that is on the application, it states that you don't have to, if your loan is under 150,000 or less, you don't have to complete it or show proof. Honestly, our bank, we're requiring that upfront because at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that that loan is gonna get forgiven at the end of the day. 
So that's really important for you as well as a business owner to know if your loan is going to get approved at the end of the day. So don't, when you bring your application to the bank, go ahead and provide it too, because that honestly shows that you have your stuff in order and you are you're, you want your loan to be forgiven. And that's what the bank wants. Um, uh, but but again, it does it does say that it's not required, but some banks, I know our bank, are really requiring that up front so we can, you know, have that control knowing that this loan is gonna be forgiven at the end of the day. Well, good to know. Okay. So you're saying I can't just do, you know what? This was a bad day. Someone just go ahead. I got a big paycheck January 14th. So I'm going to start by a quarter January 16th and go those three months. You're not saying I can't do that. You're saying it has to be got to be. Yep. You can't just make your own 90 day lock in. Is that what you're saying? Correct. I have some people say, well, can I use February, March, and April? No, can't do that. Um, yeah, they're saying, well, it's three consecutive months. Then that's that. No, they, when I sat on a billion SBA calls and they are adamant about the traditional quarters, they are adamant about that. Okay. I would also say now you, you, as a Schedule C borrower, or, you know, you may not have in uh, a quarter that makes sense, uh, but you may have an annual, right? So you can take annual. Uh, however, you got to file your taxes. So you got to have your 2019 taxes filed. And obviously your 2020 got to be filed to show an annual. And so some businesses obviously are not filing their taxes and, you know, until, you know, April, you know, they're not going to have that done. So highly unlikely that that will take place, but you can do an annual comparison, but you got to be filed taxes. And one other thing that I, and, well, I'll wait till I get to that, that slide, but, um, but yeah, you want to make sure that if you if you do have a twenty five percent reduction, it's correct. Um, you want to make sure that you qualify because you don't want that to be an issue on the back end, and now you're stuck with this loan that you have to pay off to the bank. And um, although it's a one percent, you know, five year note, it's still you know a hindrance to everybody that this loan could have easily been forgiven. Hey, so you feel this with this forgiveness. Are you seeing that this might be helping out some small businesses boost up their business credit? So this might be like the first loan for a business owner, and this might help out their business credit, or is it not really doing that because they're not making any payments? I, I would say it's not really, you know, because for one, we're not pulling any credit. Um, we're not really doing a lot of underwriting um, to that. I, I, what I will say is doing though, it is building that relationship that you're saying. So I've met so many new businesses who either came over now their clients or, you know, been banking with us for 30 years and never needed a loan. What that is doing is saying, hey, Joe Blow, ABC company, uh, hey, your business is going well. We need to sit down and talk. And so now there might be some opportunities to kind of help you. We, again, as far as helping your business credit, no. But I also think on top of now you're, you know, getting in front of bankers and bankers are getting in front of good customers. What it's also doing is forcing businesses, I believe, and this is my own theory, of getting their paperwork together, right? So now you kind of understand the expectations of, you know, gathering financials and the importance of that. So, you know, you got to get personal financial statement. I got businesses who file losses every year on Schedule C, you know. I understand why you do it. Don't get me wrong. But in this case, if you file and if you have a negative on line 31 on your Schedule C, which is that's what we're looking at to show if you qualify for the loan, if you have a negative, you don't qualify. You don't, you're not eligible. And so I talk to businesses, this is why it's very important to, you know, plan, you know, I understand why you write it off, but if you could show some growth every once in a while, because if you come to me with negative, continuously negative financials, it'd be difficult for me to give you a loan. Uh, but, you know, showing some growth, having your paperwork together, knowing what to bring to the bank, understanding what a personal financial statement is um, or a profit and loss statement, which, you know, you need to provide that. I think this now kind of gets a lot of businesses thinking about, let me get my documentation right. Let me get my paperwork right. And then along the lines with what we're doing here uh, with all these other resource organizations, now they're helping them with the technical assistance piece. And so now businesses are getting educated on 
the profit and loss, the balance sheet, you know, year over year gross revenues. Now they're hearing that language, which before they, you know, it wasn't really a thing to think about. Um, so now I, I think it's, it's financial reporting and technical assistance is going to get ramped up um, all across the country because of what the PPP has done for a lot of these businesses. So on the application, a few things that you must certify is, you know, obviously the current economic uncertainty makes the, the loan necessary to support your ongoing operations, um, that the funds will be used to retain workers and maintain payroll or to make the mortgage lease and utility payments. Uh, documentation uh, verifies the number of full-time equivalent employees on the payroll and dollars amounts of payroll costs. You know, it covers the mortgage interest payments. Uh, you cover, you know, your rent payments. Uh, and also this next round, they have expanded what you can spend your 40% on. So covered worker protection expenditures. So Jason, if you all had to modify your office to be more, you know, COVID safe and, 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 and six feet apart, whatever you got to do, you got to buy the face coverings, whatever you got to do, you can factor that into the, some of the 40% uh, expenses that you could spend on um, from the loan cover property damage. So we know there was some uh, riots and some other things that happened out there. If your insurance company did not pay for that in 2020, you can now factor some of that 40% into that. Um, um, and now you can spend some of that money on that. And of course, the, the utilities within the 24 weeks of, of, of getting the loan. So that just kind of talks about some additional resources that you can use and leverage your, your funding for. Um, and so, which I think helps businesses uh, uh, who may not just qualify for utilities and rent, but they have some other expenses that, you know, cost the business, you know, buying workers face masks, whatever you got to do um, to keep your people safe. I think that's rightfully so should be included in how you spend these funds. So. Uh, the others can um, nonprofits, you ever talk about nonprofits for round two, what do they, what nonprofits have to show for round two or what did, to apply for it? Same thing, um, you know, churches, uh, you know, we have a lot of churches that we work with, um, you know, profit and loss statements or some type of reporting documents. We also know they may have an accountant or a, C or, or, or a CPA may provide some type of financial documents that, um, uh, that they may have to provide that they can show proof of the 25% reduction in, in gross revenue. So yes, nonprofits qualify for it. Um, and, and they have to show the same things. Um, but again, it's just, you got to have that documentation show proof. It can't be written on a notepad. It got to be somewhat legit. Uh, bank statements, whatever you have to show proof of, one, that you have the payroll, and B, uh, that you got that 25% reduction, you should be eligible to get this money. So I can't just write my profit and loss statement on a, on a napkin at the bar and, and give it to you. <laughs> Good luck. Maybe Miss Cato will give you give you some money, but I, I, no, I, you got to go somewhere else. <laughs> hey, that's how hey, banks. You know, we don't loan out money at MFIS, man. Just take it to the bank, man. <laughs> so no, no, that's why that technical assistance is very important, and I do encourage businesses to, if you need help with that, go to your local small business development center. Contact the SBA. They have resources out there. They'll find you somebody. And so don't feel like you have to do it yourself. Don't get intimidated by the process because majority of you all qualify for this money. Go get it. But just find help and ask questions. Somebody will lead you in the direction. Again, your bank should point you to somebody or somewhere where uh, you can get that information. Um, you know, you, again, certify, you acknowledge that the lender, you know, will calculate the eligible loan amount, you know, using the tax documents you submitted. So what we do is, you know, we're going to go in and kind of do some quick calculations and make sure your numbers are right. You know, uh, you know, you asking for a million dollars, but your payroll is less than 50,000. You're going to have a problem. Your bank is going to call you back and say, hey, you know, that's one thing again about the you know, that picture of that local bank. We will call you back and say, hey, this don't sound right. You know, maybe you misplaced something, <laughs> you did something wrong, and that's fine. So big banks, you know what they'll do? They'll deny your loan and kick it out. And I've seen that happen too. And people haven't heard nothing from their bank. Um, and I'm not downplaying big banks. I just say the value 
of banking with the local institution, you have that that experience specifically during a challenging time. So yeah, we'll do a little calculating to make sure your documents are right, make sure your loan balances is, is, is pretty accurate. Um, and so you must be confident in your numbers, but also banks may come back and say, hey, you know, you actually qualify for 10,000, not 25. And this is the reasons why. So just be prepared for that. And then, as I mentioned before, you're applying for your second draw, you have already used up the funds in your first draw. So you, you do kind of have to show proof that you spent that money. Yes, it may not be forgiven, but if, if, if it hasn't been forgiven, you got to at least either submit your application for forgiveness and or uh, show documents of how you spent that money so they can feel confident that, you know, at least your first one will be approved because you showed this. Um, and, and now we can go ahead and start your second draw. So when you come to me, um, please provide the following items or if you go to your particular institution. So what we talked about, not a napkin, Jason, but a payroll tax filings, you know, payroll tax forms from 2019, 2020, you know, we'll take your 941s, your 940s and your W3s. Um, you know, your form 1099 for miscellane miscellaneous records, uh, schedule C for sole proprietors. So we are looking at that line 31, that net income, um, and also schedule K for ownership uh, distribution. So on the schedule K, we're going to look at that 14A box on that uh, document um, to really kind of determine, you know, what you qualify for. Um, and if you have employees um, or you're paying yourself in payroll, the easiest way is to download some type of payroll report or again, bank statements are easier. Um, if you are self-employed and don't have a completed Schedule C, you can submit a profit and loss statement or you know, just like the first round, you may have your 2019 filed, uh, but you, you might wanna uh, com complete a Schedule C performa. It doesn't have to be filed, but provide us 2020 Schedule C Performa to determine what your eligibility would be. Uh, but just be thinking, if you provide a Performa at the time of forgiveness, we're going to look at that Performa and compare. I'll give you an example. So we had some situations where an individual filed a Performa, it's 2019, they haven't filed their 2019 taxes yet by the time they apply for the PPP. Uh, so when they did that, the Performa, they said, hey, they qualify for X amount of dollars. Then when it came down to forgiveness, they provided their filed tax return schedule C and they were in that negative. The net income was negative. You know what happened? Tell me what happened, Jason. Go ahead and guess, T, what do you think happened? Didn't go through. They were ineligible for the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, so basically what you did was just created fraud, you know, for the bank, because if you knew that you filed this number, you know, as a performer on 2019, and then you filed your taxes showing a negative loss, we in the bank and the SBA were anticipating you having some type of gain, you know, it didn't have to be accurate, but it could have been some way, some type of a gain, right. close to that number, but you filed a loss because why? You don't want to pay taxes. Now you're kind of defrauding the system. And now, fortunately, now your loan is ineligible to be forgiven and we have to set you up on payments. And so at the end of the day, we didn't want that. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, that's what it is. So I encourage business owners, just try to be as accurate and just don't take this as an opportunity to get over on the system because the SBA, the government, the banks, they're going to watch themselves specifically on the second draw. There's a lot more monitoring that's going on in the back end. Um, that you want to make sure you try to be as accurate as possible because they'll catch it. You know, so there's going to be some people going to get by, obviously, but uh, for the most part, they will catch it. An important piece that they added literally probably about two Fridays ago um, was any unaudited financials must be initialed on the first page and signed and dated on any page after. So if you're submitting financial documents like your personal financial statement or you know, a uh, you know, your 941s are pretty much they're, they're fine because they're getting, obviously they're going through the tax returns through the through the IRS. 
stress. But if you're showing some performa records or some personal financial statements and uh, just some, some, some other accounted prepared documents that are not audited, uh, you have to initial and sign the first page and then initial any page beyond that. Um, that is just kind of a new requirement. And honestly, it's kind of a SBA 7A thing that has to be done um, on any traditional loans. Uh, but yeah, that is something that is new. Uh, that just kind of lay, that just take the onus on, that puts the onus on the borrower that he's he or she is providing uh, valid information. Um, so the most important piece is forgiveness, right? So we, the bank wants a forgiven, the SBA wants a forgiven, and ultimately I know the borrower does not want to pay any loans back. We want it to be forgiven. So the most importantly, are you eligible? So um, um, first draw, in order to qualify for full forgiveness, employee and payroll levels are maintained. You must maintain those levels. The 60-40 rules are met and your PPP funds are spent on eligible expenses. Got to do that. For the second draw, as I mentioned, same thing. Employee and payroll levels are, are maintained. Must be able to show 25% reduction in comparable quarters between 2019 and 2020. That's going to be that key piece. That's why it's very important just to give that up front so people can see that you have it already in the system. Um, the 6040 rules are met. And then of course the PPP funds are spent on those eligible expenses. You know, quick question, uh, Theotis as well. What's gonna happen to a lot of these restaurants who might have this PPP now you've seen, especially here in California where, where you know we had a longer lockdown than the rest of the country where you started to see Restaurants are getting boarded up. They're closing in small businesses. What's going to happen to those people who took out those loans? Are it, are did they have personal obligation towards them, or, or what's going to happen? It's a good question. Um, hopefully, they're able to spend that money before they did. Um, or you know, you don't. Once you reach your eight weeks and you spent that money, you know, file for forgiveness and get rid of it. You know. Um, I do know in, a, in an important note talking about restaurants, and I'll go back to that on this second draw. Um, initially, individuals, in order to qualify, what we look at is your average monthly payroll, multiply that by 2.5, and that gives you your max loan amount. On the second draw, restaurants and anyone who have an NAICS code of a 72, uh, beginning with 72. They qualify for their average monthly payroll multiplied by 3.5. So they get that additional one additional 1% 1 multiplier and uh, that gives you their max loan. So hopefully that will help them not shut down and keep operations open. Uh, however, if that is the case, like I have a situation where a customer has a great business, but they actually, they didn't shut down. They sold two of their restaurants. So what they would have gotten approved for in the first draw, it's going to be reduced because they don't have that same amount of employees that they had on the second draw. So we are going to have to compensate for that and actually give him money that he's received on, you know, that on the employees that he currently has and not what he did in 2019. So for those businesses who, who did that, you may have to modify your loan, but if you know you're closing or if you know your business is going to fail, I mean, as much as I want to say, yeah, go get the money, you know, it may not be the right thing because if you don't spend the money or have the records to show for it, you may now have a loan on your books. And yes, you'll be personally responsible. Yes, the bank will obviously, you know, the banks are covered because they have a hundred, 100% 100 guarantee. It's the SBA and IRS you're going to have to deal with, right? So yes, now it's not guaranteed. The bank doesn't have any type of collateral or guarantee on this note. Um, with personal guarantee, but the SBA does. That's where all those certifications you're signing and all everything else. So now you got to deal with them and I, I don't mess with the SBA or the IRS, none of those three letters. I don't mess with them. But, uh, but for the most part, as long as you do what you're supposed to do, you should be fine. Um, I had a question about, I know there was a lot of businesses who didn't apply during the first and second rounds. Have there been any additional efforts to have some of those small businesses apply during the third round? Absolutely, and that was, that's a great question. Um, so 
in the beginning of this round three, what the SBA did before they opened the floodgates for everybody else, they opened it up for some of the smaller institutions, CDFIs, um, banks, you know, credit unions, those type of institutions to go ahead and either market to their customers, or I'm sure there was some outreach going out to try to connect with some of those uh, those 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 organizations, so those small businesses to get them in the door to apply. So that was a great thing because if you remember on the first round one and two, I mean that money was gone within about a week and a half. Like right, what? Um, and so and you're talking about billions of dollars gone. So what they did was instead of having everybody like the larger banks come in run their their, their portal and take all the money away. You didn't have, I love them. I love them. The Lakers going to get their money. I love them, but you know, they, they got their money. Um, but you don't have those larger institutions to, to take hold of that, you know, the, the pot so quickly. So they were able to open it up to the smaller institutions to get that. Another thing is they are focusing on the minority underserved businesses. So I know Kansas City, um, I think there's Philadelphia, and uh, there's other pockets out there that are really doing some concerted efforts to connect with those minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, uh, smaller Schedule C independent contractor businesses to apply because to your point, either they were intimidated to go on and get it, they didn't have a contact or a resource to go get it. And so there are some groups mobilizing to connect with these small businesses to get them uh, access to this money. And so again, if you are a small business who needs some assistance, who don't know where to start, go to the SBA, go to your local SBDC, someone should be able to point you in the right direction. Definitely. No, that's a great point. I think, you know, like I said before, a lot of small businesses were intimidated by that process. And then by mm -hmm. the time, you know, maybe they were looking to apply, funds had run out at that point. Yep. And so I was surprised at how many people did not know it or did not take advantage of it for one, but but there were some people who didn't know about it. Like I'm hearing, I'm yeah. dealing with some customers now in this third round who's like, you know what? I didn't know nothing about it. Like, like where are you been? That's the only thing that's been on the news. <laughs> uh, you know, you just never know. Some people are knee deep in their business. Some people don't watch the news. You just never know. So it is a responsibility of like what we're doing right now, get it out there, let educate people, let them know what's going on. Like these small groups in these regular cities are reaching out to some of these small businesses because you also got to think about it. I can easily say, hey, go to sba.gov website and go look up the information. But if there's a digital discrepancy, is there, if there's a digital divide in some of these you know, rural and minority communities who don't have access to Google or Facebook or whatever the situation may be, um, they don't know about it or they don't know who to ask. Um, so if you don't have that, let alone now you got to come to a bank and ask for money, that just adds another layer of anxiety to the to the picture. And so it is important to continue to do what we're doing right now and what these other organizations out there are doing to connect with some of these businesses who who, who need access to this funding. Great, definitely. Great point. Great point about that. Um, because I think there's a lot of urban myths when it comes to the PVP, the EIDL, the unemployment, um, so I think this is very helpful. And there's also tons of scams. So watch out for this tons of scams out there. There's We all heard about the unemployment scams out there. And I know there's the PVP scams with the shell companies and all that. Tell people, do things legit and find legitimate companies who truly have your best interest at heart than this, these times. Because you don't want to be the person who's holding the bag when things are going down. As you're hearing more and more of uh, these fraudulent things happen, uh, where people might be on purpose or not on purpose happening. So I definitely want to tell that to folks as well. I will say if you do, or if you are skeptical, um, the SBA, they have this office of OIG. I should know what the OIG means. Office something general, in or in, in something. OIG, they research that. Uh, they, it's kind of like the attorney general. They will research any scams, any fraud. Honestly, I have people emailing me saying, Theos, is this legit? Um, sometimes it's not. I say, hey, don't respond or let me send it to my SBA contact and see if this is legit. And a lot of times it is. So, uh, but 
I would, like Jason said, contact uh, some local resources, your bank, credit union, whoever you use. Um, it's very important that you do, because you're right, there's a lot of scams. Um, and it's funny, I even had somebody try to scam me about the SBA. I'm like, I work in this. Oh, dude, I don't got a small business, you know? And so, but again, that's just one of the things that are out there because they're fishing. And one quick question, uh, one quick note I'll end with, I had a client who literally took advantage of it the first time and he was nervous about going around the second time. He just could not, under, you know, he, he just, he just was hearing things out there. And I literally had to talk him into taking this money. He qualified for it. He's paying his employees for sitting at home, uh, not taking advantage. You know, he's paying his employees to keep him on the payroll because, you know, once he, you know, if he's cut some, they're going to go work for some other contractor and he's not going to be able to have his good people back. So he just said, hey, until our contract starts in March, I'm going to keep paying y'all, you know, but, you know, luckily they have enough funding to keep doing that. But I was telling him why, like you get this paycheck protection money, they're on your payroll, take advantage of it. So we got customers who literally qualify, who, who has, who's doing everything right, but are just unsure about the program. And I literally had to talk to me like, you need this money. You're doing great. You qualify, come get it. This is why we're going to do this thing in the front end, which is that 25% reduction to say, hey, this is why you qualify for the forgiveness. Um, and so luckily he did it, but he was still kind of nervous. Like, yo, it is, I'm not sure. Like, dude, you're good. Your first loan got forgiven. We're going to take care of this. Uh, but you are paying people to sit at home and you can't keep living like that. So, so very important. And lastly, if you have not taken advantage of the EIDL loan, which is the emergency injury disaster loan, which is directly through the SBA, it's a loan funded through the SBA. I would say do it if you need it. Um, it is a low interest rate, 3.75 fixed rate for 30 years. If you're a nonprofit, it's 2.75 for, for 30 years, interest rate loan. Um, they, they did around the first draw, open up the advances. So you were able to get an advance between one and 10,000, depending on the amount of employees. And that was forgiven, uh, and, uh, on the loan, or it was, it was a grant, I guess you would say, um, they have not opened up that window again, but I hear they will open up. But if you got it the first time, I know there's some, some discussions or they're going to give you another one or not. We don't know. They're still working out the details, uh, but that may be an option as well. So again, there are some programs out there for small businesses. Uh, so I would seek the SBA website um, or contact your bank. They should be able to provide you with some resources with that information. Different. A quick question, too. If I own two businesses or two different business entities, can I apply for both entities? Yeah. Long as they have uh, separate EIN numbers, um, there there is a question on the application that requires an addendum A. Basically, it asks if you are in twenty percent or ownership of of a, another entity. You just have to document that. So write it out, put the EIN number, tax ID number, whatever on a document, um, and submit that with your application. But yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Really, that's good to know. Yeah. So um, a little bit about Urban Financial Services uh, Coalition. I was going to go to that. If you have questions, please contact Jason Matthews about the SBA, PPP, or myself. Uh, but I uh, just want to give a little bit about Urban Financial Services Coalition. Uh, we've been around since 1974, uh, formerly known as National uh, Urban Bankers. Uh, I am the Western Region Vice President of this great organization. Uh, so I support chapters like Omaha and Kansas City and uh, our great chapter in San Francisco who's doing big things and, San, and, and Seattle, Puget Sound. Uh, so you can go to any one of these websites, learn more about us and please visit us. And then ufsc.net.com is, um, is our main uh, website for our national link very great organization. Ultimately, we are looking to empower, inspire uh, more leadership in financials in the financial services organization. We also go out and empower and inspire our communities through financial literacy and education. But ultimately, the goal is to, to really 
find ourselves all minorities, all people, women on, women, men of all colors, shapes, and creeds to get better. You know, I think financial education is very important. Uh, this is a great organization to be have a safe place to practice. Uh, we're led by our fearless leader, uh, Ola True Love, uh, who is our national president. Jason Matthews here is our Western Region uh, Vice President as well. And so we are glad to be a part of it, glad to be a service um, and here to support. So uh, look us up and uh, let us know if we can help. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Any last comments, T or any of the T's, Tandaway or Theodos? Like <laughs> the T&T combo, the T&T right. combo. Very explosive. <laughs> I'll let you have it. No, I just wanted to say uh, you did a fantastic job. I hope more businesses uh, apply this third round and, you know, um, with some really great information. So if you haven't already, take the contact information down and contact Theotis Watson. Um, and she should be able to help you out with those PPP loans. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and again, Jason, I appreciate you and, and, and T putting this together. I think it's very important. And, and one of the things I ask you all is also be easy on your bankers. This next round has been a lot more difficult and challenging. The SBA is doing a lot more monitoring on the back end. So if you haven't heard from them in the last few days, it's just because they're working hard and, and, and trying to figure it out. Uh, there are some additional monitoring that's happening on the back end where I know the first round we were getting approvals within a matter of minutes and uh, now it's taking days for the SBA to respond because they're doing a lot of other checking on the back end. So uh, be patient with us. We will get your loan taken care of. Uh, as of last Wednesday, what I heard was about $35 billion that's been spent. Uh, so there's plenty of money out there. Um, and, and so uh, an important question about the PPP is when um, does it end? When is the last day to apply that Ms. T challenged me before we got on this call? It's March 31st. So you have to apply before March 31st if you want to go get this money. So I would encourage you to jump on it at your earliest time. But again, I thank you all for uh, allowing me to be here. Uh, allow me to have my, I know I'm in the Bay Area, but let me have my KC Chiefs in the back. I need everybody to go out and support us going back to back, baby. I know that was not a part of the agenda, but I had to throw that out there. Uh, but again, no, I appreciate everyone uh, uh, listening and allowing me to be here tonight. Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys all. Thank you. Thank you again, Theodore, for coming out here on, on, a, uh, on a Thursday night. I know you're in Kansas City. I know it's getting kind of late for you guys. I definitely appreciate it. But I know the American people uh, and the community need to learn about this and really understand the PPP program. As I know, there's been tons of talks just been, where people, I've been to the gym and hearing, I've been hearing people left and right, and there's been so many urban myths. So to have you on this is so powerful. Uh, once again, if you guys do have questions regarding it, you can ask Theotis, you can ask Tandaway or me. We can definitely point you to the right direction. And I want to say thank you guys all again uh, for getting on this call. And good night, everyone. And God bless. God bless. Good night, everyone. Good night.